a published a funding opportunity announcement. Now it's called a notice of funding opportunity uh, specifically for mission related R&D projects. And um, we, we did that in FY20 and FY21 and, and there's a there's a announcement out now for FY22. And it turns out these, these, these grants, are, we had overwhelming response to them. We were really pleased with that. It, they're highly competitive. We, the first two years, 20 and 21, we received over 200 proposals and were able to award 26. And the, these projects are supported under, uh, under this program really do complement the research and development that we're doing here at the NRC. Uh, in our programs. The uh, reminder that the, the fiscal year 22 funding opportunity is out there right now and it closes on April 5th. So I hope uh, uh, everybody out there, if your university is uh, listening in, uh, please, please apply for these grants. As I mentioned before, the grants complement our research portfolio. The, I, th I think the added benefit to these grants, it, it, it directly engages students, university professors, and, 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 and uh, university programs in, uh, in, in, uh, to work that's relevant to the agency, that's helpful to us. We really value these, these projects and it really also is there to help develop the next generation of engineers. One area where we, I know we could approve in the grant program is the participation of uh, minority serving institutions. And to encourage greater participation this year in, in our notice, we, we encourage institutions to, to uh, develop partnerships with, with MSIs. We continue uh, to evolve our, our UNLP partnership with DOE and, and the NNSA to ensure our programs are complementary and provide uh, coverage for the various technical areas we're all interested in. All right, with that, next I'd like to just briefly introduce all of the speakers today, and uh, and then we'll get into the presentations and Q's and A's. So the format is we'll, uh, uh, I'll introduce the speakers, we'll have presentations from each one of those. After each individual presentation, we'll, we'll have a Q&A session. So please submit your questions throughout the session. And then at the end, we'll all come together with a, with a brief panel discussion. So first of all, I just briefly introduce uh, the, the uh, presenters, Maria Avramova, professor at North Carolina State University, Kadir Siner, the an assistant professor from Auburn University, and he'll be accompanied by uh, uh, graduate student Joshua McLeod. And then uh, David Medich, he's associate professor at uh, Worcester Polytechnic uh, Institute. So uh, thank you again for all the panelists. And uh, we're gonna start with uh, you, uh, Maria. Uh, uh, Dr. Avramova is a professor of nuclear engineering and, and university facility scholar at North Carolina State University. She's founder and director of the NCSU Consortium for Nuclear Power and a founder of uh, and coordinator of the International User Group of the NCSU Advanced Nuclear Thermal Hydraulic Code CTF. Dr. Avramova holds a, a BS diploma in engineering physics from Sofia University a St. Clement uh, Oritsky in Sofia, Bulgaria, and an MS and PhD in nuclear engineering from Penn State. Uh, Dr. Avramova has led several high visibility international programs supported by the Nuclear Energy Agency and the Organization for Economic Do uh, Cooperation and Development, and, uh, the IAEA, the USNRC, and DOE. Currently, she's co-chair of the NEA OECD expert group on core thermal hydraulics and mechanics under the working party on scientific issues and uncertainty analysis of reactor systems of, uh, of the nuclear science committee. And uh, so the, the topic of her presentation is going to be the development of uh, liquid metal fast reactor core thermal hydraulic benchmarking for uh, verification, validation and uncertainty qualification for quantification for of sub channel and CFD codes. So Maria, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, first of all, I would uh, like to, um, let me find a way to look at my, sorry, I don't really see my, my slides, but uh, I will uh, open 
Yeah. Maria, your slides are up, and if you just ask, uh, they'll they'll uh, change your slides for you. Yeah, that that that's fine. Uh, sorry about that. So, but yeah, I would like to uh, to thank or to acknowledge the work of, of the team. This is not just um, a work done by by a single person. Um, it's a joint work between North Carolina State University and Texas AM University. We have Dr. Hover and uh, Ko Takazuki. Uh, he's a graduate um, assistant um, at uh, NC State and Dr. Rodolfo Vagetto and Professor Asin Hassan from Texas AM. Please advance. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this presentation will uh, focus or will discuss the research and development project with a long name, as we already um, heard about it. It's OECD NRC liquid metal fast reactor core thermohydraulics benchmark for uh, VVUQ um, of a subgenuine competition of with dynamic codes. It's funded through the US NRC University Leadership Program Grant, and it is in line with this NRC strategy and plan for advance um, um, of non white water uh, reactor research. It's intended to help NRC to prepare for incoming challenges related to validation of uh, codes for um, new uh, non white water reactor types. And we also hope that we will provide the nuclear industry with um, well-defined international st standard problem based on high fidelity resolution data for validation of uh, such tools. So we really hope to contribute to establishing modeling and simulation tools for licensing and operation of liquid metal fast reactors. Uh, please advance. Next slide, please. So that's briefly the outline of my talk. I will give you an overview of the benchmark. We'll talk about the uncertainty quantif quantification strategy that we'll um, be uh, using, and then a brief discussion on in importance of the benchmark to, for the industry and regulation, and ending with conclusions. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So again, that's. Uh, benchmark which will employ a series of well-defined problems with complete set of input specifications and uh, reference experimental data. And it's uh, interesting that we have here data from two different facilities. So we have um, a 61 pin uh, test facility, uh, liquid metal fast reactor uh, test faci facility at Texas AM. This is a very recent data, high resolution, high fidelity, um, very good quality data. Um, and then we will be using another data, legacy data uh, from TORS experiments uh, performed a long time ago at Oak Ridge National Labs. And TORS stands for thermohydraulics out of reactor safety experiments. So the first set of data, the Texas AM data, we have pressure drop and velocity distribution in a very uh, fine resolution. And for the TORS data, what we have, uh, what we have as a data is um, temperature measurements and pressure drop uh, as well. Next slide, please. Briefly again about the benchmark team, it's Texas AM and uh, North Carolina State University. It's sponsored by US NRC. Thank you very much for that. Uh, but it's important to mention that it's also endorsed by uh, Nuclear Energy Agency at OECD. And they provide supporting activities in terms of uh, establishing benchmark website, email distribution uh, list, coordinating the benchmarks uh, the, the workshops which are within this benchmark activity, distribution of materials, preparing reports, and, and so on. We have a website, you see the, uh, the address there. Um, our benchmarks is also linked to uh, an ongoing benchmark within uh, NEA, that's the sodium fast reactor uncertainty analysis in modeling benchmark. And it's uh, uh, again sponsored and monitored through the expert group on reactor thermohydraulics and mechanics from um, NEA. 
Oak Ridge uh, will help us for the second phase. And you see we have um, uh, three years. We're just in the beginning of the second year in, in our um, activity. Next slide, please. So I, I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time here on this slide. And it, it's a busy one, but uh, I think it's important because the benchmark as we um, envision to, to, to have it, it's slightly different than the traditional benchmarks that we are used to see. So uh, our goal is not only to just uh, predict the measure value and compare and say we are good or bad. That's, um, that's just the beginning uh, of the task. But um, let me first uh, talk about the two phases and the objectives of, objectives of each phase. So we have phase one, which is focused on Texas AM data, also numerical predictions of Texas AM separate effect test. There are three main objectives here. And uh, first one is to provide a high resolution experimental data of isothermal turbulent flow and pressure drop. And isothermal is underlined because it's very important. We want first to target the fundamentals before moving to heated conditions and, and so on. So that's the first uh, objective. And we will use that to assess the performance of numerical schemes and different turbulent models currently implemented in um, CFD code, computational fluid dynamic code. Finally, we want to establish best practices for uncertainty quantification of module geometry, initial boundary conditions, other associated uncertainties in the CFD calculation. And this is the first link to the, the, the sodium fast reactor uncertainty analysis of modeling benchmark, which is ongoing. Um, so now you probably have noticed that uh, that's mostly Phase one is mostly targeting CFD codes, but only subchannel codes can um, um, be uh, applied here as well. Then moving for the, to the second phase, this is on the TORS data. It's more like integral effect test. And we will have here with our targets or objectives are to provide a sodium turbulent flow and heat transfer database. Now for validation of both CFD and uh, subchannel codes. Emphasis on the importance of the uncertainty analysis in this simulation. And again, we want to establish best practices for quantification of uncertainties, propagation. Another link to the ongoing SFROM benchmark. Develop guidance for um, CFD model validation for those, this type of reactors and update the current uh, TH models for pressure drop and interchannel mixing for the coarser TH codes, like subchannel codes. Finally, develop a hybrid experimental simulation database needed to establish and calibrate the low fidelity coarse resolution models uh, with high resolution, high fidelity data. Uh, so, Again, I, I just want to, under, uh, to underline again, what are the differences to the traditional benchmarks? We are using two different facilities. That's a challenge. And there may be some uh, uh, you know, issues caused by that, some inconsistency. But we really want to do that in order to try to, to derive some um, lessons, how you can use the old legacy data, a good data, but maybe not well documented, missing uncertainties, bounds, and so on, and complement it in some way with newer data, even with um, numerical data, if we wish. Uh, that's the first one. And we are targeting different fidelity codes, CFD versus subchannel, even system, if you know, think <laughs> can um, uh, use this benchmark as well. And the other, the, the, the next important part, the topics here, or the subject is really propagation of the uncertainties. High to low is a very hot topics in the simulations, but there are very little work. There's very little work done on estimating the uncertainties of the, uh, you know, models developed based on the uh, data from high fidelity codes being propagated to the low fidelity codes. This is something that we want to, to address. Uh, okay, let me move to the, then to the next slide because the time is running. Next slide, please. So uh, I'll start with phase one, going over the, the benchmark uh, phases. 
That's again the Texas AM data. We have 61 pin wire wrap fuel bundle, completely isothermal room temperature. You see the solid material, it's uh, acrylic plastic, and then you have p cement as a working fluid. It's a new data. The, the facility is still on operation. That's very important um, uh, as well. Uh, next slide, please, please. Can you move to the next slide? So very briefly, I'm not spending time here. So a lot of information. I just um, I want to show it to you to give you a flavor of uh, what we have. Those are the dimensions of the main test uh, section and nominal conditions. Again, uh, you see it's 69 pin bundles. It's almost two meters uh, total length. Um, a very representative geometrical conditions for the uh, liquid metal fast reactor bundles. Um, Again, system pressure around uh, slightly above 100 uh, kilopascals and uh, room temperature. Next slide, please. What do we have as experimental data for comparison to uh, or for the benchmark? So we have a pressure drop and high resolution velocity measurements. Um, as we saw in the very first slide of the presentation. So the, the the measurement techniques are particle image uh, velocimetry and particle tracking velocimetry. So we will, for the benchmark exercises, we will have the pressure drop along one axial wire pitch and um, particle image velocimetry measurements for vertical uh, and axial, uh, vertical and axial plane. Um, and you see uh, photos of the facilities there. So uh, with that, let's move to the next slide where we will see what kind of data we are requesting from the participant. So um, starting with the pressure drop comparisons. So uh, you see uh, the, the geometrical details here and uh, we have uh, several or uh, a few pressure, top, pressure differential pressure tops. Um, with uh, measurements available. Now, I really want to spend more time on focus on the requested output. So again, look here, we are not requesting only the predicted value of the, uh, the pressure drop. We also want the participants to provide the uncertainties. They have to, to estimate what are the uncertainties coming with that predicted value in order to compare it to measure value it's, uh, with its uncertainty. And um, similarly for the velocity, please move to the next slide. Uh, similarly for the velocities, uh, again, we, the, uh, we have again a very good high resolution velocity measurements here for different Reynolds numbers. Um, velocity data is measured in fully developed region between the, the pressure tops. And again, what we will request is velocity prediction plus uncertainties. And I'll talk what kind of uncertainties are being propagated or we'll ask participants to propagate um, when uh, providing the output uncertainties of their predicted velocity distribution. Um, so uh, let's move to, to the next slide where we have the uh, moving, we will move to the second phase. This is the integral effect comparisons to the TOR data. Uh, so we have a different story here. It's a um, legacy data. Um, as you can see, the, the experiments were performed in uh, 1970, 80s. On the next slide, we will see the the whole uh, you know, set of uh, available um, data. We are not targeting the whole database here. It's not needed. We uh, are targeting just selected part of the database. Those are bundles 3C, 6A, and 9. You will see the speci uh, specification on the next slides. Um, the good things about 3C and 6A, those are public. Uh, the data is publicly available. Um, 3C involves steady state with blockages, sorry, uh, and um, transient conditions. 6A, it's natural circulation and boiling. It's very interesting. And then 9 is the one which, bundle 9 is the one which at least geometrically corresponds to the, uh, completely almost to the Texas AM data. And um, over there we have um, steady state and transient uh, 
data available. Let's look at the table on the next slide. Um, so that's the, the, the entire TORS experimental uh, campaign given here. Uh, again, we have different number of pins in the bundles, blockages, um, configuration simulated, and, and so on. We, once again, we are targeting the last three here, six, eight, three, C and N9 for our um, um, benchmark uh, exercises. Let's move to the next slide. So, um, TORS data um, is again an old data, it's not digitalized. <laughs> we, we, the first thing that um, the benchmark uh, is facing as a challenge here is uh, data recovery for the, the we have to put it in a nice digitalized format for the use for the for the benchmark. Um, again, most of the TORS report is still export controlled, but again, we, we don't need everything out from the data for, for this benchmark uh, activities. And we are working with the um, with GAIN, the Gateway of Advanced uh, Innovation in Nuclear Office. Um, they are assisting us for uh, with releasing just a part of the bundle nine, which will be used in, um, in the benchmark uh, exercise. Again, the other two bundles, 6A and 3C, those data, this data is publicly available. Okay, uh, I think I'm maybe running out of time, so let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, talking about the uncertainty quantifications, so again, we, we want to uh, we will like the participants to, to propagate the uncertainties. Uh, input propagate input uncertainties and provide an output predicted value with um, output uncertainties. So the, the uncertainties to, to be propagated include fluid properties, boundary conditions, manufacturing tolerances. For the Texas AM data, we have um, defined pressure drop and velocity measurement uncertainties for comparisons. And we, we have the temperature uncertainty for, for the TORS data. So uh, we are giving the participants the freedom to, to choose their, the, the, their own uh, available best of um, best QE um, or UQ uncertainty quantification methods. Coupling to, uh, to tools and codes as the quota is um, encouraged and possible. And this is what the, the benchmark team is actually doing with. CTF Dakota and NEC 5000 Dakota being, being coupled for to propagate the uncertainties. Um, next slide, please. Uh, very quickly where we are. Um, so I, I will move quickly through, through these slides. So the, the benchmark is it's open minded somehow. So we, we are requesting output for measure data plus uncertainties. But as we see needs for adding additional information that can can be done uh, uh, as well. So we, we we don't want to limit ourselves to to a particular output format. And also we we are doing our uh, independent reference calculations on both CTF um, subchannel and uh, CFD site that will assist uh, the participant with that. Next slide, please. Um, I'll have my final slides to kind of um, conclude on, on the benchmark. So what are the contributions again to summarize briefly? It will provide uh, liquid metal fast reactor turbulent flow and heat transfer database for high resolution model validation. Emphasis on uh, uncertainties, propagation, how to, to, to you know, um, address these issues. We want to develop guidelines for um, um, high to low propagation and even model validations, including the uncertainties uh, as, as well. And we really aim to develop a hybrid experimental simulation database necessary for the validation. Next slide, please. Now, uh, where well, we are with the, the status very briefly. So phase one is uh, already, the specification for phase one is already released. By the end of this month, we will release uh, specification on phase two. That's done through the NEA, uh, to the, the, the agency. Uh, we had our first benchmark workshops this past June. It was virtual. The next one is 
this coming um, end of May, beginning of June, and it's going to be hosted by CA France. Um, and as a deliverable, we have, um, uh, ben uh, of course, uh, benchmark specification um, results, reports, and, and so on. And I really want to uh, conclude with the last slide, just briefly to summarize what um, uh, what the benchmark it is. So if you move to the last slide, it's the conclusions. Uh, next slide, please. So again, the benchmark, the intention is to serve, um, to address the modeling challenges by assembling teams of experts. That's it's very important. We, we cannot be isolated from the rest of the world. We, we have to, to work with experts from uh, around the world. So right now, for example, we have uh, um, participants from um, Europe, US, and Asia in, in that uh, benchmark. Um, but again, the focus is not only on comparing, comparison to experimental data, but addressing um, issues with the propagation of uncertainties and uncertainties in the predictions as well and developing guidelines, guidelines. We really hope that we will be able to assist US NRC as our uh, sponsor and industry for upcoming challenges, especially related to modeling, design, and licensing of new reactor types, particularly liquid metal fast reactors. The, the very last slide that I have in the presentation are just the references. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and I'm open for questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, Maria. This was really very interesting. It looks like you've, you and your team's made a lot of progress since the since the award was made. Yours, yours was in the first group of awards, so I I, I, re, I really enjoyed that. I, I and and I, I I really like how you've brought in a lot of participants in this. I, I imagine it's a logistical nightmare to get every everybody together. And and I I also wanted to comment on the. The, the data recovery that you're you're doing with uh, Department of Energy through GAIN. I, I really encourage that. There's a lot of data out there. Don't give up on trying to get it. It's it's there. It's just, uh, it, it just may take some time. So. Um, doing doing fabulous job there. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Uh, I, I You did mention, you know, on the benchmark participants are, they're encouraged to use the best uh, uh, uncertainty quantification methods that are available to them. When you have multiple participants like this that contribute their results to the benchmark system you, you're developing, though, though obviously there are, there'll be differences between the results. Could you comment on, on how, how you plan to treat those differences in, in the overall understanding of uncertainties in, in the current capabilities of, of modeling the, the thermal hydraulic phenomenon and the LMFR cores? Yeah, that's actually very good questions, and we um, uh, we we do have some experience here because um, I, I personally was involved in other benchmarks for uh, pressurized uh, water reactors, boiling water reactors. But uh, uh, important part is when, uh, in in my my understanding, is uh, when asked for a participant to submit results, you have to ask them to to fill or submit uh, answers to questionnaires where it's a really detailed questionnaire is where the participants should describe what are the numerical methods, nodalization, assumptions, everything which go to the simulations. Because at the end, we will be comparing different codes, different fidelity, different resolutions. Uh, you may have um, user effects when you use different users use the same decode, use the same code but apply different assumptions. You have different modeling um, fidelity codes, subchannel versus CFD, how it's here, or even using different models to predict the same phenomena. So um, asking for uncertainty of the predictions and co compare those to uncertainties in the measurement, that's one thing, but we we want to somehow systematically um, define different clusters uh, of um, predicted data and see how to, to address the uncertainty in that. And let's say the cost, one cluster could be, let's say, subchannel codes uh, using that modalization, or one subchannel code used by different participants with different um, assumptions, and, and so on. Th that's very important, uh, just to see where the problems could be coming, what are the gaps we have 
to have a systematic basis for comparison of the of the predicted results and uncertainties. When I say predicted results, I include the uncertainties there uh, as well. So um, of course, um, each cluster uh, within each cluster of uh, you know codes to or prediction available um, for. Every participants, you, you can do the, the, the common things like using um, a main error and start on deviation, start, sorry, standard deviation based on the difference between the mean calculated and measure value and so on. But it is important to compare apples to apples. Let's put it in this way. So this is why we, we are asking for a very detailed questionnaire or supplying that questionnaire and uh, asking uh, participants to to submit that I don't know if I answer your question yeah or... yeah that did that that was very good Maria uh, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry we don't have any more time for questions right now but thank you very much Maria uh, I thank really you. appreciate it and thanks for what you're doing on this NRC pro uh, sponsored project uh, next uh, next we'll go to uh, a, a pr presentation by Auburn University uh, dr uh, Kader uh, uh, Center. He's an assistant professor in the civil engineering department at Auburn since uh, 2019. Uh, Dr. Center has been actively involved in numerous research projects pertaining to nuclear structural engineering that were funded by both public and private agencies. Prior to joining Auburn University, he devoted much of his time into research on testing, analysis, and development of design specifications for steel plate concrete composite structures for use in Gen 3 plus nuclear power plants, such as the AP-1000 and the USAPWR. He subsequently was the lead research engineer in a project funded by the USDOE to investigate the in-plane and out-of-plane shear behavior of both steel plate uh, concrete and reinforced concrete structures. These projects involved large scale experimental investigations and advanced computational studies of of uh, RC and SC structures to understand their fundamental behavior under extreme loading conditions, such as seismic events that involve operational and accidental thermal conditions. The outcomes of these research projects have been incorporated into the code specifications that govern the design and construction of steel concrete composite structures for safety related nuclear facilities and used extensively around the world by engineers, consultants, and regulators. Dr. Center has also uh, participated in a research project funded by the USDOE through the RPE program, where the project focused on investigating different concrete technologies for deployment in stable salts. His current react research interests include investigating topics that will enable the widespread implementation of next generation nuclear power plants and small modular reactors, including seismic thermal and soil structure interaction behavior. And uh, with, um, with Dr. Center is uh, Joshua McLeod, who is also working on this project. So I believe uh, you, you guys will be tag teaming on the, on the presentation. And the, the topic is development of a soil structure interaction framework to, in support uh, to enhance regulatory oversight of small modular reactors. So uh, Dr. Center, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Um... Despite being the least experienced among the speakers today, I seem to have the longest introduction. I should have cut that short, but um, yep. Greetings to all the attendees. Uh, again, this is Kadir Senner, system professor at Auburn. I'm gonna talk about a research project that we recently started working on uh, that was funded in FY21. And again, the title is uh, same as our project, as um, development of a soil structure interaction framework in support to enhance regulatory oversight for small modular reactors. And I should mention that during my talk, I will interchangeably use acronyms, mainly use SSI for soil structure interaction and uh, SMR for referring to small modular reactors, which most of the audience would uh, be familiar with that. So since we recently began working on this research in this presentation, I'll just give a broad overview of the project and highlight some of the important aspects. Uh, but hopefully next year we'll show some research results. Uh, so the project team includes myself and Dr. Jack Montgomery at Auburn University, 
and we have Professor Amit Varma at Purdue University as a co-PI. Uh, as mentioned uh, and also shown on the slide, we have two students working on this project, Brian Hurley and Josh McLeod. And Josh, again, will uh, actually present a couple of slides during this presentation, so you'll soon uh, hear from him. Okay, next slide, please. So I'll start with highlighting some important structural attributes of SMR designs that are currently under development. And uh, when we did a gen survey of general structural layouts of SMRs from publicly available documents, we noticed that a common feature of these structures was the partial embedment of critical compartments below ground level. And this was regardless of the vendor. Uh, you see some examples on the slide where we have various SMR designs from several different vendors. And it's a common feature to have partial uh, buried, uh, partially buried structure by typically placing the reactor compartment below, below ground level. And uh, this partial burial feature of SMRs is desirable uh, because it adds an uh, additional layer of safety against natural or man-made external hazards and also potentially minimizes the effects of internal hazards by limiting the exposure of contaminants or extreme heat during an accident scenario due to these critical compartments not, directly, uh, not being directly exposed to the environment. Next slide, please. So the partial burial of these compartments is advantageous, but at the same time, uh, this burial leads to uncertainties in the seismic behavior of SMRs, as the dynamic response will largely depend on the soil structure interaction behavior. So understanding the rocking, gapping, sliding behavior, and accurately incorporating these into our models uh, to assess the dynamic response becomes even more critical for these structures. Since SSI effects are less critical for surface structures, most modeling evaluations of these above ground structures typically disregard the nonlinear soil contact and interface behavior. And uh, obviously there's a lack of large scale experimental data for validating these models. And therefore, our main motivation is to fill this gap through conducting large-scale experimental studies and developing advanced numerical simulations that are validating, uh, validated against uh, reliable test data. Next slide, please. So our overarching goal is to support regulators in assessing new generation power plants with the specific object of our research of developing a framework to analyze and evaluate the seismic response of SMRs while accounting for their unique structural attributes and nonlinear soil structure interaction. So we identified two major research trusts to accomplish the objective. First, addressing the need for large scale uh, experimental research to clearly understand and characterize the SSI behavior. And secondly, developing numerical modeling methodologies, validating against the physical data generated during the experiments, which can then be used for modeling and uh, evaluating SMRs or nuclear facilities with similar structural attributes. Next slide, please. To accomplish these objectives, we have uh, three major phases in our research. So the first phase, we will conduct large-scale SSI experiments on partially buried caissons to generate reliable test data for validation. Once we have the experimental results in the second phase, uh, we will develop experimentally validated numerical finite element models. Uh, these models will be based on time domain uh, rather than frequency domain methods since we know that the frequency domain uh, modeling tools, despite being the industry standard for SSI evaluations, they have several limitations in terms of accounting for nonlinear interface behavior and also requiring separate models than uh, structural models, which is a uh, additional effort. 
And then in the last and third phase, we plan to validate this uh, developed modeling approach against actual field data from past events, and also perform comparative studies against frequency domain analysis methods to highlight the differences. Uh, so next, uh, we'll give more detail about each phase. And now Josh will take over the talk about, uh, to talk about what we plan to do in the experimental phase and, uh, and then Josh is obviously our future engineer that we're uh, training through this research program. So uh, please go ahead, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Sinner. Uh, next slide, please. So as mentioned, the first phase of this project, we'll be conducting large scale SSI tests to generate some experimental data to validate our numerical simulations. Um, the tests will be conducted in our newly opened Advanced Structural Engineering Laboratory, and we use a very unique feature of our lab. As you can see in the pictures on the slide, we have a geotechnical testing chamber that is built into our strong floor, floor that is 20 foot in depth and 24 by 10 foot in plan, which will allow us to conduct these soil structure interaction tests. Um, having the geotechnical chamber built into our strong floor allows us to apply large loads as well as dynamic loads. Um, into structures that are inside the chamber when it's filled with soil. With this unique feature of the laboratory, we can conduct tests where we closely control the physical properties of the soil, particularly the density and saturation levels. Large scale tests will allow our results to be more representative of realistic field conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So we plan to have several testing parameters in our experimental program. Um, on the slide, you can see a schematic of our planned SSI experiment layout, where we're going to apply loading on a caisson that's located in the center of our geotechnical testing chamber. We're planning for the caisson to be as large as possible while still maintaining enough distance from the boundaries to allow potential failure modes to occur. Some of the parameters we'll examine in the experiments are caisson shape, including circular and cuboid shapes, different surf materials such as steel, concrete, or a geosynthetic liner, and different caisson burial depths. In terms of soil parameters, we'll be using a granular backfill and planning to look at two different compaction levels to examine soil density and different saturation levels. The loading types, we look at initially uh, quasi-static loads, the plan with increasing ampl amplitudes at low frequencies. Uh, following these low frequency cycles, we plan to apply sinusoidal harmonic motions while gradually increasing the amplitudes and frequencies until we reach the limits of the hydraulic system in our laboratory. The following loading phases, we plan to move towards more realistic loading schemes that will represent the response of structures to ground motions expected in eastern and western United States. We also plan to repeat some of these tests at different surcharge loads on the soil to account for different levels of overburden pressure that would be applied by the main structure. Next slide, please. During these tests, we plan to record and monitor the response of the soil and the structure using various sensors, including displacement, rotation, acceleration, and pressure sensors. Displacement sensors and inclinometers we placed on the caisson to obtain the force displacement and the moment rocking angle response of the caisson. Vertical displacement sensors will record transient and permanent settlements of the accel of the caisson and the soil surface. Accelerometers will be placed on, in the soil and on the caisson to measure accelerations and pore pressure sensors in the soil and at the interface will monitor fluid pressures in the saturated tests. Surface pressure sensors on the caisson will be used to measure dynamic pressures and to report gap formation. We're also going to take samples of the soil near the caisson after testing to evaluate any part crushing at the interface that may occur. Um, integrating these results will allow us to determine the dynamic capacity of the soil structure system, which can be compared with static interface strengths and existing analytical models for SSI behavior of caissons. Um, next, Dr. Sinner will take over again to discuss the numerical phases of our project. That was great. Thank you very much, Josh. Can we proceed to the next slide, please? Great. So as Josh talked about phase one, which is the experimental phase, and uh, I'll continue talking about the uh, upcoming phases or the following phases two and three. 
And uh, so once the, once phase one, the experimental phase is completed, uh, we will start working on developing benchmark numerical models using time domain finite element software and validate them against the test data. Uh, so the models will use nonlinear constitutive material models and nonlinear interfacial models. Uh, the soil material will inc incorporate several plasticity parameters for detailed definition. And the interface model will uh, have features to capture uh, the behavior in both in normal and tangential directions. Uh, we plan to use one or more of the software listed in the slide and uh, depending on the, their finite element and material model capabilities. As we have seen similar studies performed by other researchers have indicated that either Abacus, Alastina, or Mastodon is capable of capturing the behavior that we would ob observe during our tests. So finite element models will include significant detail regarding the test set case on, uh, test chamber boundaries, and incorporate measured dynamic properties of the soil. Uh, compar comparisons will be made against the hysteretic and backbone curves of the measured load displacement or moment rotation responses. And we will do qualitative and quantitative comparisons uh, using the various pressure measurements uh, that we obtained during the test against the analysis results. Uh, next slide, please. So once we complete that, we're in the final uh, phase of our project where we plan to use our developed benchmark numerical modeling approach and conduct a comparative numerical study of a real seismic event on a large scale structure. For this study, we chose to conduct an exploratory study on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant due to the available soil profile and ground motion recorded during the major event that took place in 2011. The developed modeling methodology will be implemented to build models uh, and compare against the structural response measured on the plant. Uh, comparative studies against frequency-based, uh, frequency domain-based linear analysis, again, uh, are the uh, current industry standard for the analysis type used in SSI evaluations. Uh, we'll do comparisons against that and point out the key differences in the performance of each approach and highlight any shortcomings or limitations of each SSI approaches. Next slide, please. So here's a timeline of our project. We expect that the experimental phase will take the longest by about a year and a half uh, and be the most critical task in our path. Uh, we plan to start the benchmarking FE model development as soon as we start having some experimental results and continue with the uh, following computational phases. We're obviously in the uh, experimental phase and hoping to provide uh, results at the next regulatory conference. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, that's all we wanted to present uh, in this session. And uh, again, we're grateful for the uh, generous support of the NRC and uh, looking forward to, lo looking forward to uh, presenting our results in the upcoming conferences. So thank you very much for your Great. attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, to, to both of you and uh, Kadir and Joshua. I, uh, we do have time for some questions, so let me get started. Um, uh, first of all, uh, that the, the geotechnical chamber, I think Joshua, you talked about, that's, uh, it's uh, really, really pretty impressive, <laughs> the size of that. I guess I think it was like 24 by 10 by 20. So uh, I, I, I don't know how you're going to unload it once you get the soil in there. But anyway, that's, that's for you guys to figure it out. But, um, but how, how would you, um, how, how do you plan to apply the insights from your, your experiments to real constructions where the structures are embedded and buried in soils that, that, that don't have the finite boundary is it is it part of your um, uh, you talked about uh, 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 sensitivity studies on the on the finite element models where, where do you where do you compensate for that from from the limitations of a, even though it's a large structure uh, a large experimental structure how do you compensate for the uh, for predicting the real life yeah. situation 
That's an excellent question. Uh, and uh, that's one thing we also have been considering when we were trying to come up with the case on size. As, uh, as we're currently targeting a meter, uh, so which is three to four feet in, in plan. And uh, when we were trying to come up with that size, uh, we were looking at the uh, distance from the boundaries so that the boundaries does not really suppress any of the failure modes that we might observe uh, with, uh, when doing the testing. So uh, although we're trying to have it come up with a caisson as large as possible, so it's, uh, it's a best representative of a uh, actual structure. Obviously we have limitations and we don't wanna be too close to the boundaries. Uh, so we have about uh, twice the size of the caisson on either side so that it doesn't, it, it has minimal effect on the results. And, uh, and then in, in uh, these sensitivity studies will obviously take into account of the uh, boundaries of the chamber and really observe if what, what kind of effect the boundaries will have on the results. But um, so at the same time, we wanna minimize it. We still want a large case on as possible and then uh, look at the uh, influence of the boundaries to, in, in our numerical models. And hopefully they'll be minimal. Uh, but, you know, that, that's how we'll uh, reflect to, and then uh, real structures in that sense. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hey, the next question in, in your large scale testing, how do you consider the scaling effects in the cy cyclic load testing, such as the such as the density of the materials? Um, scale effects in the sense that we will use just regular soil in it. So there is no scaling in the soil side. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I mentioned, these are not really simulating a full scale structure, right? So our main intention actually through these tests is to obtain that interfacial response between uh, whatever material we're using, whether it's steel caisson, concrete caisson, or some geosynthetic, and then look at the pressure at a large scale test. So it's not like these will be directly used for an actual structure, but in a sense that will, these will become the properties that we use in the interface. Uh, so hopefully with, with the you know, large sizes that we have, uh, we, we hope to have minimal uh, scaling effect between what we measured in the test versus uh, what's done, uh, what, we, what we would use in the models for the large scale tests. Because the alternative for these tests was uh, centrifuge tests, which are significantly scaled uh, when, when doing these type of experimental SSI studies. So at least we're getting uh, much, much closer to reality as opposed to those very small scale centrifuge tests that are commonly done in the uh, in, in research. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, Kader. Um, a substantial amount of excavation, soil replacement, and soil compaction were done for the Vogel three and four uh, project to address uh, liquefaction. How applicable is that information for the work that you're doing in this project? Um, so part of the uh, specimen test matrix that uh, Josh mentioned had a uh, parameter in saturation. Although, uh, so, so we can control the uh, water level in our soil, uh, but we would most likely not consider liquefaction as a main parameter. As, as mentioned, you know, the, these structures when in, in real world, when they're uh, built, there'll, there'll be uh, large ex excavations will take place and then the uh, soil will be uh, compacted with granular backfill. Uh, so the density levels we expect are in the high range, sort of in the 80 to 90 percent mm -hmm. relative densities. So that's what we're mainly going to target and uh, maybe that's a great uh, follow-up project to look at liquefaction <laughs> effects. Uh, but currently we're gonna address more of the common uh, cases and then for special cases, I'm sure that would be a good good uh, next project. Well, um, 
Well, that's uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thanks, thanks to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Senator and, and and Joshua, and, uh, and our, we really look forward to updates as this project gets going. So, thank you very much. So, thank you. Uh, our next our our next uh, discussion will be from uh, David uh, Medich. He's associate professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and Dr. Medich received his PhD in physics studying nuclear and radiological sciences at the University of Massachusetts Lowell in 1997. During this time, he was a senior reactor operator and then the chief reactor operator for the UMass Lowell one megawatt research reactor. After receiving his PhD, Dr. Medich uh, spent an additional year as acting director of the UML research reactor. And he says he's still tickled pink about uh, thinking about the time he ordered and received a shipment of uh, of a uh, uh, new HEU fuel, and uh, uh, supposedly there's a picture of you holding one of the fuel elements. So we'll, we'll have to see that. We'll have to see that sometime. So uh, Dr. Medich then became a postdoctoral researcher at University of Virginia. He was a senior scientist at Implant Sciences Corporation, the director of the University of Massachusetts Low Radiation Safety and Materials Program, and was ultimately appointed as an assistant professor professor at uh, WPI in 2012, where he helped develop their new nuclear science and engineering program. He was promoted to an associate professor and granted tenure in 2016. Dr. Medich had been a qualified expert uh, consultant for the IAEA and is presently the vice chair of the ISO Radiation Protection Committee on the editorial board of the Health Physics Journal and is the chair of the Operational and Medical Health Physics section of ANSI N13. He also is on the executive board of the American Board of Health Physics and the author of more than 30 published journal articles. His personal mantra is that it is all about all about the neutrons. That's a good personal mantra, I like that. So with that, I'll turn it over Turn it over to you, David. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. And it is a pleasure being here. Um, the purpose of my research is to adopt a, uh, a Gen 4 micro reactor, which is something right now that's being developed for use as a next generation source of university research reactor. And being that it's a next source university research reactor, we're also looking at kind of advancing what research reactors do and operating this reactor as more of a hybrid model where it's not only producing neutrons for research, but it's also going to produce electricity for the campus. And I'll talk about how we can envision that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, based on what I've seen for uh, the topics giving at, given at this conference, it seems you know everyone here probably has a very um, uh, a broad understanding of power reactors, uh, probably much better than I do um, from my physics background, uh, but maybe not as much for research reactors since I didn't see too many topics here. So I just wanted to kind of uh, remind you or just go through the basics of uh, the status of nuclear research reactors in the, in the United States right now. So nuclear reactors are non-power reactors and their purpose is to be used for training and development purposes. Uh, next slide. Uh, when we look at these U.S. university research reactors, we see that they operate between about zero to 10 megawatts thermal. Um, they were developed initially primarily to, stu to study reactor operations and provide greater insight into nuclear physics and engineering, you know, especially things like cross-sectional tables, which we now pretty much take for granted, uh, or, you know, half of them were probably um, uh, obtained from research reactors. Now, as, the, as these research reactors started becoming more mature, uh, then they really started to uh, be noticed that their neutrons were a very, very good tool for um, research in other fields, such as chemistry, biology, engineering, medicine, geology, etc. But here's the thing. Um, these fields, these research fields, oftentimes need uh, high intensity neutron sources. And when I talk about neutron intensity, uh, I'll talk about either engineering flux or uh, uh, science uh, fluence rate, which is neutrons per square centimeter per second. Um, and you're going to get these high intensity neutron sources from research reactors um, that I'll say uh, operate at about five megawatts thermal or more. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so to date, the university, uh, the U.S. has built 59 research reactors. Of those 59 research reactors, 25 remain in operation. The question is why? What are the limits of university research reactors? And this is what I want to focus on. All university research reactors are based on designs made in the 50s and maybe into the 60s. Um, they all began operating between the period of 1955 to 1975. And just because I want to make sure I keep my time commitment, I'm just going to kind of gloss over this, uh, these next two areas and say that now that university research reactors are becoming more and more of um, a source of neutrons for research, I will say that there's only two university research reactors right now that actually can meet all current research needs, and that's the uh, MIT reactor and uh, MER. Uh, MIT runs at about six megawatts, MER runs at about 10 megawatts, and really what this causes is a huge limit to scientific research, a huge bottleneck. Um, there are plenty of examples, but for example, one of my areas of research that I've recently gotten into is uh, neutron radiography of plant roots, potted plant roots, and when I first got into that area of research, um, you know, I did my due diligence and I was looking at um, what is the state of the art, uh, you know, through all these review articles and half of the review articles I looked at would talk about, you know, in one sentence, they would say, we have neutrons that they actually have a higher contrast um, between the different tissues and they have higher resolution, um, but it's impossible to get neutron beam time. Um, so, and it's true. I mean, you're oftentimes making beam time six months in advance. So, you know, because of that, they said this is not a great opportunity. Um, the other half of those uh, review papers didn't even mention uh, neutrons at all, just because so few people uh, could use them because they're not easy to use. Next slide, please. So, what does it mean? Our reactors, uh, our research reactors are roughly 50 to 60 years old. And the vast majority, I would say 23 out of 25 US research reactors can be considered underpowered. Um, I did work at the UMass Lowell reactor and I know all the different things that our one megawatt reactor when I was working there, what our one megawatt reactor couldn't do uh, in terms of research, brachytherapy, nuclear medicine, um, uh, small angle neutron scattering, the list goes on. So next slide, please. Okay, concurrent with that problem, is another issue that's going around in the United States right now. And that is universities are really pushing to become more sustainable and reduce their carbon emissions. And it's all about, you know, can a university become carbon neutral? Um, this was the easiest slide to make in my whole slide deck because it took me all of about two minutes to get these, these, um, uh, these topics. On the left, it's, it's, my screen is a little blurry uh, in terms of the slides, but on the left, I just did a simple, a simple Bing search where I looked at uh, university sustainability and I got page after page after page of all the different universities and their sustainability programs. And in the middle and then the right, I looked at the news and I was able to get from pretty high profile um, uh, university websites uh, talking about university actions and life, uh, all talking about how campuses are going green or should go green or et cetera, et cetera. So next slide, please. So you take those two issues and you bring them together. And what I think is that a nuclear microreactor might be the best um, option for replacing these research reactors originally designed in the 50s. And, and I'll quickly remind uh, or I'll quickly summarize some of these things about a nuclear microreactor. So a nuclear microreactor is a type of Gen 4 reactor um, currently being developed. They aren't being built right now, but they are, they are in the development stage. And the idea of a microreactor is they're small. So when we talk about their power, you know, we've talked about in previous talks, small modular uh, research, or excuse me, small modular reactors, um, micro reactors have a lower power than these SMRs, uh, typically around 20 um, uh, megawatts electric or less. Next slide, please. Okay, so specifically, what is a micro, uh, micro reactor? First, um, its output is going to be low. So this slide, which is nice and, and citable, um, and it has nice graphics I decided to keep. It says that an output is usually less than 50 megawatts electric. 
Um, oftentimes, if you do a uh, search on the internet and you look at publications, they'll talk about 20 megawatts electric. So, you know, you can go somewhere between that. You can compare that to a cur uh, current power plant, which is on the order of 1,000 megawatts electric. So, you know, again, you're looking at something that's maybe 50 to 100 times to even 1,000 times if they're operating a megawatt lower in power than current power reactors. Next slide. They're also designed to be modular. And of course, as you know, we've seen with TVs, the whole goal of a modular design is that, yeah, in the beginning, um, first off, it's actually safer to uh, produce a modular design rather than having a completely new structure every time you go to a different facility but, um, uh, and easier to construct. But over time, you'll see modular designs have marked uh, decrease in prices. And again, if you look at your TVs, you can talk about what happened when HDR TV, uh, yeah, HDR TVs came out, they were very expensive. Then as the, the, the um, science became uh, and the engineering became standard, then the prices went down and yada, yada. So, you know, modular, these modular designs really can have longer term effects for uh, the viability of uh, all these next gen reactors. Next slide. The thing that really got me going, well, and this was really the first, uh, my first introduction to a microreactor, is that these microreactors have to not only be small in power, but these microreactors were being designed for use in places like, um, you know, places that are off the grid, essentially. They're remote, or they could be used um, for military deployment sites, or they could be used, you know, the, the thoughts, they could be used to um, help out uh, uh, regions that uh, are overcoming a natural disaster. So they have to be transportable. And with a microreactor, the idea is a microreactor has to fit on the bed of a truck, all right? So within a truck, and that includes the part of the microreactor that generates electricity. So the entire system can fit on a truck bed, which is amazing. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing about these Gen 4 reactors are that they have to be inherently safer than the Gen 2 reactors uh, of the past that, that are currently being run. Uh, and so what happens is, you know, you'll have your, for example, negative temperature coefficient where, you know, you'll, you'll um, uh, uh, inhibit the reactor from having a, a positive temperature coefficient of as it gets hotter, it gets more efficient to producing neutrons, which makes it hotter. Et cetera, et cetera, and you lead to a Chernobyl incident. Okay, you won't get that with current Gen 2 reactors in the United States. Um, so that's a safety, a passive safety system. But one active safety system with current reactors is you have to have someone there to ensure that, for example, if the reactor is shut down, that the reactor is being cooled, right? That there's water in the reactor uh, vessel to make sure that you can remove that decay heat. Now, um, and of course, that was the issue with Three Mile Island, right? So with these next generation reactors, the idea is to keep all of these uh, safety systems passive, including uh, the need for having someone intervene to ensure that there is a, um, a de a pro appropriate decay heat removal during a shutdown. And so they do that in, in many ways. There's new uh, types of fuel that has a much higher melting um, point, like for example, triso fuel. And a lot of places are looking at things like, for example, um, nuclear grade uh, graphite as a uh, moderator. So what it means is these huge reactor um, uh, control rooms of the past, if I can go to the next slide, will not be needed. And so when I talk to, for example, our colleagues, we're, we're working with Westinghouse on their uh, Evinci reactor, as I'll mention slowly, uh, shortly, really these micro reactors are meant to be, you know, seeing being that they're supposed to be employed in these places that may not have um, a lot of people that can take the time to constantly be ensuring that the reactor is operating safely because they have pass passive safety systems. You don't need these huge control rooms. And, you know, when I talk to the people at um, uh, Westinghouse, their comment was, yeah, you know, this, these reactors can be run off of a a laptop. So it's it's kind of an interesting and different paradigm. Next slide, please. Okay, so putting all these things together, what are the advantages of uh, using a micro reactor as the basis of a next gen university um, research reactor? First off, 
these microreactors are going to be operating at equivalent um, thermal powers to a lot of these high demand re uh, university research reactors. So, for example, if you're talking about a um, reactor, the one we're working on is a five megawatt electric. So five megawatt electric means you're probably going to be producing about five megawatts thermal of power. And that puts that reactor, at least the one we're investigating, that puts it a little above um, the MER reactor, the 10 megawatt MER reactor, and a little below the uh, 20 megawatt um, NIST reactor, uh, both of them research reactors. So that's really good. You now have a way to um, inexpensively, hopefully, uh, uh, and quickly be able to uh, perform a lot of this research, which is now uh, bottlenecked. So next, interestingly enough, these microreactors can meet most universities' um, power needs, as we're going to show, at least in the case of WPI, and of course, uh, meet those uh, university carbon reduction goals. And so, you know, where universities now are giving these 50 year plans towards being carbon neutral, which, quite honestly, if you can't do it in three, I'm not sure, you know, what they're assuming to, you know, become carbon neutral in 53, uh, 50 years from now, other than making some really um, uh, difficult uh, and possibly not very accurate uh, assumptions on uh, what they think the world is going to be 50 years from now. Now, you know, you can have a, an immediate huge impact on university carbon reduction goals. Of course, because they're, mo they're modular, they can be stationed at a university fairly quickly and economically. And last, and this is just the side thing, um, we've had university research reactors operating in the United States for over 50 years. And these research reactors, there haven't been any major safety issues that we can point to, you know, such as with power reactors. And they're in major cities, Cambridge, um, you know, and, and all sorts of other big cities. Uh, and so really, right off the bat, this is a good way to promote public support for next gen reactors, because we're going to say, OK, well, you know, here we have these research reactors that already have been operating safely. But now we're having this next generation of research reactors. And you know, now we want to use them to not only um, be built, but also to enhance fields like, you know, no one, no one could uh, argue that you can't be doing a good thing if you're making medicine that's used to treat cancer or you know, diagnostic um, uh, equipment that's used to uh, detect disease. You know, these things are like, oh, that's really great. So next slide. So you take. These four items, next slide, you add them together and you get happy graduate students. And actually you really get a happy public, but for me, as long as I have happy graduate students, my life is easier. When my graduate students aren't happy, that's you know, kind of a, a, a miserable time for me. So next slide, please. All right, so as I mentioned, we're using the Westinghouse Evency Microreactor as our basis for our advanced um, uh, or next gen research reactor. Uh, the Evinci is a very high temperature reactor. Its, its designs were just finalized. We, we are also a second uh, generation recipient of the research um, proposal of the NRC research grant. So we're still kind of in the early phases of uh, our plot project. And not only that, but uh, as I mentioned, Westinghouse just designed, uh, it finalized their design in the fall. So now we're, we're um, kind of really up and going, trying to uh, uh, start development on our project. Uh, it uses a solid core and an advanced heat pipe technology. And this is another advantage because, because you want a compact micro reactor, um, what's going to happen is when we developed um, these original uh, reactors, the whole idea was, you know, we're not going to be we're not going to be um, worrying about uh, anything like optimizing neutron flux. You just wanted to get to see, you wanted to see how reactors operate. So long story short, um, because these micro reactors are being built with more compact cores, you know, because you really want them easily transportable, then what's going to happen is at the same power level as let's say a current research reactor that may be more distributed, you'll be producing the same number of neutrons roughly between the two reactors. But because the microreactor has a more compact core, that will mean a more intense neutron source. So right off the bat, you're operating at the same energy, let's say, and you're getting an, an enhancement in terms of your neutron intensity, which is the key to all these research projects. So it'll really help with research. 
Um, power output of the EVNC is up to five megawatts. It's claimed for a 40 year design life with three year refueling, um, targeting less than 30 day on site installation. And that's typical for all these um, uh, micro reactors. So that means, you know, everything from soup to nuts, once the reactor goes on site, that within 30 days it's producing electricity and sending out electricity to the region. Uh, it is, as other micro reactors, being designed to be operated autonomously. And uh, it, as a very high temperature reactor, it's also uh, able to prov provide heated water for building heating and superheated water for desalinization and hydrogen generation. And with the hydrogen generation, I can see this as another advantage for uh, universities that uh, might need hydrogen for their research. Next slide. Okay, so the question is, can EVNC meet WPI's energy needs? In um, 2020, WPI produced about 25 million um, kilowatt hours or, or used 25 million kilowatt hours of electricity. So if you do the math, that turns out to an average um, amount of electricity at any point in time during the year of 2.8 megawatts, which is well within um, EVNC's five megawatt uh, uh, power capabilities. And uh, according to our facilities director during that year, uh, our peak electrical energy was 4.1 megawatts electric. So actually, the EVNC seems to be able to um, meet all of the power requirements for uh, WPI based on our 2020 numbers. And I will say uh, based on our 2020 numbers, because we did do, uh, we just built a new building on site. So they're going to change a little bit. Next slide, please. Now, from all our campus activities. Uh, in 2020, again, we generated about 15,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. And those greenhouse gases, uh, the EPA can divide them into two types, scope one and scope two emissions. Scope one emissions are due to uh, things that happen on site that produces greenhouse gases. Scope two emissions are due to us using electricity, which further away causes the uh, power source to um, generate uh, 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 carbon gases. Uh, so actually, if you look, first off, as I've already mentioned, we can not only meet the electrical needs, the scope two needs for electricity on campus, we can probably exceed them, um, which would put us in kind of a scope or in, you know, potential for a negative um, uh, carbon impact. And it, this is unfortunately blue. Uh, I pulled it off a report uh, from WPI. Our scope one emissions, 90% of it, if not more, is all from burning natural gas to heat water. So, you know, also being able to use water to heat uh, some of the buildings uh, at WPI could have a big impact on uh, those uh, emissions. So yeah, this could really impact greatly the uh, amount of carbon uh, that we produce per year on campus. Next slide. So the main aspect of our research, and again, we really haven't been able to um, advance too far in this because uh, we're still in the, the, the version of uh, designing a uh, Monte Carlo model for the Evinci reactor, but we will be designing uh, an MCMP model for the Evinci reactor. We're right in the middle of it. Uh, and then once we do that, we're going to use the uh, model to determine the shielding needs of the reactor. And that's kind of going to be our base for uh, generating our research reactor. And, and once we do that, we're gonna compare it against Westinghouse's scale model. And we're gonna use that to validate the two models, um, their model and our model to make sure that everything looks um, reasonable. Now, once we do that, and as we're hoping um, that, you know, we could like to call this a next generation research facility, we're also looking at uh, advancing some of the uh, uh, facilities that have been used uh, at uh, research reactors for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. First off being uh, thermal columns. And in our plan, we're looking at using a micro column array to uh, image at higher resolution influence rate rather than the single long um, collimators currently used. And we're also looking um, at the um, prospect of uh, uh, using fast scattering materials in, you know, surrounding the X-Core uh, neutron activation ports that we're planning on building. Uh, and we want to look at the cost, not only the cost, but also the uh, increase to um, neutron intensity to see if you can do this, and which would be an interesting thing. Um, research, uh, modular reactors as they are, you know, being modular, they're built in a certain way. And so it might be an issue 
that uh, you probably will not have in, in certain um, models, the ability to have a center flux trap. And the difference between irradiating something in the center of a reactor versus, let's say, immediately outside a reactor vessel could be um, a loss of intensity on the order of a factor of 10 or more. And uh, again, that's not too bad with these uh, uh, micro reactors because one, because they have a smaller core, um, you really won't have such a decrease in power uh, in intensity because of that, again, you know, you're going to be um, creating a more intense beam to begin with. Uh, Westinghouse has a, um, as other uh, very high temperature reactors are using graphite um, in their system to, uh, uh, as a way of removing heat uh, and other uh, piping technologies. But uh, there is a center flux trap or a center area that's um, filled with graphite that they would like to uh, create into a flux trap. And they're talking about using two models, a research model and a pure energy model. So they might be able to get a center flux trap and we'll be looking into that. But in addition to that, we'll be looking at beam ports, uh, cold neutron sources, et cetera. And uh, we will be uh, doing a structural analysis for uh, facility shielding. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go over this very quickly. We had uh, a few years ago, we wanted to, when we started learning about small modular reactors in this case, we wanted to see if uh, indeed um, these uh, more compact cores would uh, increase the uh, flux at a given power. Uh, we did a simple, uh, these were, um, our capstone students, our senior thesis students, we did a simple project for them where they simulated um, uh, an SMR reactor at the minimum level of, uh, of uh, power needed to get uh, a given K effective and compared it just against a few other reactors. And we did see that increase. Next slide, please. And this is work that just recently came about with our uh, micro collimator arrays. And so the key is uh, currently, when you wanna make uh, an imaging uh, source for neutrons, you have these collimators, which you know to get a really high resolution collimator, you're talking about something that's uh, three to four meters long. And of course, during those three to four meters long, you're suffering a significant one over R squared reduction in intensity. And then of course you also have to, in the collimator, if you don't, um, vacuum out the, the tube. If it's not evacuated, you'll also get attenuation of the neutrons just from the air uh, present. So you tend to get a, a big loss in signal. And when people do a lot of imaging at uh, high resolution, um, it takes a long time. So what we're trying to do is replace it with an array of microcollimators. Um, these uh, microcollimators that we're testing, we actually have some experimental data that I didn't throw in yet. Um, these microcollimators have uh, uh, 10 inch diameter holes and uh, they're separated by like 12, um, uh, 12 micrometers center to center. I think they have like a 60 to 70% opacity for uh, transmission uh, for neutrons. And the key is that these holes and their separation are so small that they um, wouldn't be noticed as a grid structure if you make the image because, you know, in our case, we were looking at um, uh, trying to get a, um, uh, a resolution, a system resolution of about 30 microns. And uh, looking at the thickness of the microcollimator versus the whole diameter size, um, I used to use L over D for anyone who's familiar with that, but I wanted to stay away from it here just not to confuse you because this is a different application. Uh, typically a T over D of 75 was uh, able to uh, hit our um, target of 30 microns. Next slide, please. One of the biggest interesting things I've been dealing with was when I deal with um, colleagues of mine who are like, well, how are you going to license this reactor? And, you know, they talk about the, their questions. And so, um, you know, in our, actually, this was in our application to the NRC. Our, our original thoughts was what we want to do is we want to initially license this reactor as a research reactor because it's a very... Um, I shouldn't say simple, but a very more streamlined uh, application. So we wouldn't initially use the reactor. We don't envision using the reactor as a power reactor originally. And so we, we use it as a research reactor. We collect data for a couple of years. And then after that, if there's enough data to justify it, we'd apply for a power reactor license. Now, that said, um, if everything goes right, we'd analyze data for another couple of years. 
And what we then would like to do is see if there's really any difference between operating as a power uh, uh, hybrid reactor versus just a research reactor. And it's very doubtful that there would be since, you know, it's just turning on power is essentially flicking a switch. Um, so, you know, what we would like to do is at least um, see if we can make the recommendation of um, having all these micro reactors, uh, at least at a certain power range to um, be licensed uh, equivalent to a research reactor. Next slide. Okay, with that, I wanna give my thanks to all uh, my students who have been helping out. I have two uh, PhD students who uh, are working on this project and two um, uh, uh, senior students who are doing their, uh, we call them an MQP, but um, their uh, senior capstone project. And they're all happy, which all makes me happy. Next slide. I also have uh, five um, junior students. WPI is a project-based university, so we do um, we do uh, we require junior theses also, and so we have um, five students looking at the uh, energy portion of this research. And I'd like to thank them. This was captured during a Zoom interview. Next slide. And of course, the um, students that worked uh, previously to give us the um, uh, preliminary data that we used in our, our, in our um, uh, application. Next slide. So with that, I would like to sincerely thank the USNRC. Uh, we had two of their research um, awards that uh, have been used to support this work, their research and development grant and their fellowship grant. Uh, Darren Roshback is the co-PI for the um, research award, and my fellowship co-PIs are uh, Isabella Stro, Germano Ayanakioni, and Sinahal Kadam. Uh, next slide. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, thanks. Thanks, Dave. I, I know we're short on time, so uh, I, I just wanted to make a comment. We won't have time for questions because I want to bring the panel back on. But mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I know it's early in the stage and you, you talked about the, 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 the attributes of a test reactor, flux traps, beam ports, that sort of thing. But it's going to be interesting how you, how you weigh getting an all-in-one reactor, what, what do you have to compromise with respect to operating cycles and, and flux and uh, experiment capabilities, uptime and downtime, that sort of thing. That, that's, I'm, I'm going to be anxious to, to hear about that. So I'm, I'm sure we'll be uh, visiting with you about yeah. this later. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a very good question because, you know, the idea is this is probably operating more as a research reactor. I guess it depends on the facility, yeah. but if it operates more on a research reactor where it could have up and down times, you know, um, it would be operated similar to how solar cells are uh, placed in a house, meaning that, you know, if you produce excess energy, it can go into the grid and you could use that as credits for times when, you know, you're not producing energy. So all in all, you know, it looks like on average, we should, even with uh, downtimes, we should be able to um, meet the, uh, the full energy needs. But even if it, you know, meets uh, half or anything, it's, it's an added benefit because the true benefit really is the research that we've been, you know, inhibiting. Yes. Well, thanks. Thanks, David. I'd like to bring uh, uh, the other presenters back in. And I know we're sh running short on time. I think we can run a little bit over because there's no sessions after this. But I did want to uh, pose a question to all of you, maybe give you each a, a quick minute to answer. Uh, and this is more of a, of a pitch for this program. As you know, we just started it uh, in fiscal year 20, made two rounds of awards. And obviously, you, you folks were successful in that. But I, I'd like to know, as we try to look ahead and in, improve the program, um, what, what attributes of the, of the of the uh, FOA or the or the grant program as you as, as you've uh, experienced it were uh, you know attracted you to apply for it and what what should we do be doing differently that could improve the the, the program and the out and the outcomes so um, uh, who would like to start with that uh, Maria how about you okay I, I can start so um, I'll be very short okay so what what I like I like the focus on the advanced reactors because that makes our students happy. They are curious about new things <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, and um, that, that's really good. The advance on uh, the focus on new technologies and 
what could be helpful, in my opinion, is uh, continuation, let's put it in this way. So um, sometimes three years or period of time, it's not really enough to completely finish one, uh, you know, development. So maybe it's good to have a continuation on, on the subject. I, I know that probably that means more funding, but this is what we like. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for that input. Uh, 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 Kadir, how about you? How about from your standpoint? Yeah. Uh, so obviously we're, uh, so our team is more uh, composed of junior professors and uh, so we're a little less experience with grants overall, we're learning them as we go. So uh, in this case, it will be the it'll be similar, uh, we'll learn as we go. But uh, so far it's been great uh, for, in our field, especially in civil engineering related work uh, or work related to nuclear, there's few alleys and uh, having NRC fund our research is first of all, you know, that's, that's the main thing. Um, what we see, um, and obviously since we're new, we, whatever opportunity that's out there, we go for it. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. Grateful for it, and then uh, I think one one aspect would be, especially for juniors like us, would be to have more feedback and more communication between NRC staff. For example, maybe next year this conference will be in person, and we'll get to meet the NRC staff and have uh, conversations with them and get feedback. Because obviously, there's many vendors that are trying to get licensed, and uh, they have their issues, which. You know, it's hard for us to know if we're not directly working with them and talking to NRC staff uh, and engineers, we can get an insight uh, on those and then make our work more relevant and uh, be more ap applicable eventually by uh, getting some of those inputs from them, which I think it would be very beneficial. Well, that's that's good feedback. I know we have been conducting some internal uh, uh, seminars that uh, where where uh, PIs are presenting uh, their their uh, uh, their projects internal to NRC. So you might want to think about doing that. We we'd be more than open to any of you to do that as you as you progress and 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 we'll we'll set up seminars for you as well uh, within the NRC. So I'm glad, Josh, I'm glad you're here because I wanted to get from a student uh, perspective what, what it helps you uh, besides uh, surviving. How does it, how, 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 how else does, what do you see of the program? How is it helpful to you? Um, I think the program is a way for me to get a direction of where I want to go uh, following completion of my PhD. Um, I'd really like to stay involved in research, um, and it gives me you know, an opportunity to get my foot in the door, uh, learn how the grant process works to continue this after my education is done. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, the, the, you have the last word on this, Dave. How about you from, oh, from I, your perspective? I think that this is an outstanding program, honestly, because I remember that period of time, um, maybe there was uh, 10 years where there was no real such support um, for the nuclear field. And during that time, I mean, these universities, uh, that's when you really started to see a lot of universities losing health physics and nuclear engineering programs. So this has done a huge service to these fields in, in propping them up. And the research program in, in uh, uh, specifically, I think is now giving a way of um, uh, allowing a lot of these new um, tenure track faculty to show research that they're doing to get tenure. So, you know, there's been a lot of support with students. There's been a lot of support with, um, you know, hiring faculty. But I think that um, this research program is uh, truly a, a great avenue to help support the faculty on all levels um, at these universities. Well, great. I, I thank you all for that that feedback, and and, and I appreciate you uh, uh, coming to the RIC and presenting your projects. I'm really excited about this, and I hope I can hear get updates from all of you in the in the future as the projects progress. So, thanks, thank you again. And and with with that, I'd like to um, I'd like to close the session. I know we ran a little over, but it was very very enjoyable to me. And here's some contacts if you have any questions uh, uh, after we close. So thanks everybody.